The miracle that we received was that we had her for the time that we had her. I turned my head to wipe the tears away. I didn't want you to see me cry. I didn't want to see you die. The reckless gun violence and use claiming the life of another child yesterday, an eight-year-old little girl. Bishop Conference to look into the extent of uh, child abuse within the Catholic Church and uh, the authors of this report uncovered some 3,677 cases of abuse. The 10 year old was pronounced dead at a hospital. Anthony appeared malnourished and severely beaten. Barron's boyfriend has been arrested on suspicion of murder. That in 2010, there were 43,977 abortions, 2009, 30,268, 2008. That next morning, I had to hand my son's body over to the funeral home. And that was the hardest thing, letting his body go. And I knew that his soul was in heaven but I just wanted to hold on to his body forever. Why do bad things happen to good people? If you would have asked me that two years ago, I would have told you that God has a plan, answered as quickly as I could, and moved on. That question tears people apart, and it often goes without a good answer. But then a little boy came into our lives. His name was Stephen. And even though he wasn't with us for very long, he gave us what we needed. He answered our question. This is his story. On May 3rd, 2018, my husband and I found out that we were pregnant. In hopes to have a girl, I was already putting stuff on my Amazon cart and I was very excited. On September 14th, 2018, we went in for our 20 week ultrasound and our whole world had changed. I wasn't even gonna go to the 20 week ultrasound. It was the middle of September. It was our last chance to get in some sailing and that's what me and dad were gonna go do. We weren't worried about not finding out the gender at the same time because we had a party planned for the next day. So she was gonna have the doctor write down the gender, put it in an envelope, and then the next day we are gonna reveal the gender to everyone, including us at the same time. So it was kind of in God's plan. The waters were too shallow to go sailing that day. So dad stayed at home with the kids and me and Lindsay went out to the 20 week ultrasound. So mom and dad are at home, me and Lindsay go to the 20 week ultrasound. We get set up in the room. The nurse does all the regular scans, takes a few pictures for us, writes down the gender on a little piece of paper and puts it in Lindsay's envelope. And the whole time she's doing all this, me and Lindsay aren't looking at the screen because we don't want to see the gender on accident and we don't want to ruin our party. So the nurse takes care of all this for us and then sets us up in the room to where we're going to meet our doctor. And he just, he looked very distraught. And he said, I have some hard news to tell you. Then he told us that he had to tell us that we were having a boy. I was expecting to hear that our baby had a cleft lip because our other two sons were born with cleft lips. But it was much more than that. And that our boy has what's called holoprosencephaly. And that means that his brain hasn't developed properly. And he's actually missing large portions of his brain. He also has some heart problems, some problems with his other organs. His body is a little malformed and he doesn't even know what else is wrong with him. Lindsay asked him if that means we were gonna have a miscarriage. And he said, with a boy, it's a lot more likely. 
and he said if you don't have a miscarriage, you'll probably lose him soon after he's born or have a stillborn. My doctor is like family to us, so he really didn't want to break this news to us. It was very hard for him as well. And after he saw Jeremy, he just put his head up against the wall and just started to cry with us. While we were headed home, we were both crying. I was crying so much that I ran a red light. I think my husband was scared that we weren't even going to make it home. And then while we were driving home, we decided to name him Steven after my dad. The name Steven is very close and dear to my heart because First of all, that was my confirmation name. And second of all, it was, it was uh, one of the first men to be ordained a deacon, St. Stephen. And uh, when I picked that confirmation name, I had no idea that I would be a deacon at the time. And it's kind of uh, in God's plan that I would have that confirmation name and that, that it would, I would become a deacon and that my grandson would be named Stephen. So his name was Stephen, and we didn't really know what was next. We just prayed that he would stay with us for a little while longer while we figured it out, and we eagerly waited our next appointment with the doctor. The following week, we went to maternal fetal medicine. They did a more in-depth ultrasound of the baby. I was hoping at this point things had gotten better, but things had just gotten worse. They told us a lot more than we wanted to hear. Just to name a few, they confirmed that he has holoprosencephaly, he has up to seven different heart problems, he has a multidysplastic kidney, he has an omphalocele, which means that his organs might be coming out of his body through his umbilical cord, he might have extra digits, fingers and toes, there's a whole list of problems. After we did the in-depth ultrasound, she sat across from my husband and I and she said at this point most people would terminate the baby is it something that you wish to do I didn't even look at my husband I said absolutely not because I knew that him and I were on the same page most people would terminate the pregnancy at this point most people but narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Our society today has taken God out of the picture, and that's why we have euthanasia, and that's why we have abortion, because we don't understand suffering. We don't, we, why do we want to suffer? Why do we have a God that allows us to suffer? Well, go back to the cross. Go back to that body. When you suffer, you become humble and i know i go throughout my life and i look at instances where i've had tragedy in my life you know losing a house to a fire losing losing uh friends and relatives i look at those moments in my life and that's the closest i ever was to god if it wasn't for for god and and our our god-fearing faith um this would tear families apart this would tear people apart this would drive people in the, in the loony bin to be crazy. I mean, literally. So lesser things have have driven people crazy or driven them to hate, um, and and even things like this have driven a lot of people to to hate God and to blame this on God. Which in turn, this is absolutely all to do with God. But he didn't do it for uh, because he's smiting us or because he hates us or because we've sinned and he wants to teach us a lesson. Most people would not have handled it like that. It would have been. Uh, an abortion and done whereas they gave him life and not only did they give him life but but I think God through him gave multiple people life within himself glory is being revealed through Stephen because you chose to allow him to live in God's presence he takes 
things where you don't think are going to affect people's lives, and it, it's more of a personal decision, and it has created a firestorm. I, I, th I think that it's, it's changed lives. It's made people with the pro-life movement, especially with the, the coverage that that got, was amazing. I mean, I remember that when that uh, came on that night, when Lindsay was on TV. I mean, my, me and my wife just sat there and started crying. I was like, wow. That, I mean, that's incredible because look at what's happened from Stephen. And Stephen's behind that, and obviously, ultimately, God is behind that. And God chose you guys for this purpose. It's a much bigger, much bigger world out there than just the little microcosm of your family because it's affected so many other people. You know, the essence of sacrifice, which you guys sacrificed five, six months, when the easy route would have been the other alternative. And that, that in itself would have changed your lives in a negative way, I think, for the, for the rest of your life. This way, look at, look at the beauty of what's coming out of this. When so. we came out of that appointment, my heart was just broken. I couldn't imagine terminating a baby. It wasn't something that was even a thought to my mind. On the way home, all I could think was, how could I end a life that's not even mine? I didn't want a chance ending his life, knowing that I could possibly hold him for even a second after he was born. I knew when we decided to keep this baby, there would be so much pain every day not knowing when we were going to lose him, but knowing it would happen. But also there was so much joy. So at the end of the appointment, the doctor wrote down all the problems that Stephen has on a sticky note and gave it to us. And when I got home, I put the sticky note on the side of the fridge. And Lindsay's parents lived with us in a camper in our driveway at the time. And we were out in the camper and dad woke up after a dream and he said someone get a bible we have to read john 9. so i got my bible out and i started reading john 9. and it says that jesus and his disciples were walking through town and one of his disciples asked him jesus why was this man born blind was it because of his sins or the sins of his parents and jesus said nobody sinned that this man was born blind but he was born this way so that the works of God might be shown through him. Not knowing what else to do, we just started telling everybody what was going on. Anyone that would listen, we'd tell them the story about Stephen and ask them to pray for us. And as much as the gospel changed our lives, the response from our community changed our lives as well. People were praying for us, telling us their stories of situations they've gone through. Masses were dedicated to us across the country and across the world. People would come over and lay hands on us. I mean, that's what it means to be a part of the family of God. We prayed together every night. I told my dad, him being Deacon Daddy, that he had to bless my stomach every night. Bless the baby. That was his job. We prayed a lot during this process. And, and we mostly prayed for a miracle. Everyone would come in. Stephen's papa, the deacon, would bless Lindsay's belly. When we'd use the sticky note on the fridge as our special prayer intentions, and we asked for God for a miracle that he would heal each one of these things inside of Stephen. I had just incredibly chilling uh, dreams to where I had to, it was like it was directing my energy to pray for you guys more and I'd wake up in the morning and you were you guys were my first thought in the morning. I was like, okay, I can't imagine what you guys are going through. So I would try to, to, to place myself in your position and pray for your perseverance and pray for your peace and calm. And when when you see other people suffering to a degree or or in experiencing something in their life that you can't wrap your head around because what you guys did really a lot of people could can't wrap their head around i mean it, it, it's a testimony to your love for each other and for god that you chose to do this and it's affected so many people and it's affected me in a way where it's humbled me to understand that that we're all in this together and and uh suffering is real and that we need to join ourselves together and share in that suffering you know, just like, just like I, uh, Paul said, I rejoice in my suffering for your sake. 
okay? So how can I rejoice in your suffering? Well, I rejoice in the suffering. Everything ties back around to the cross. Later on, we had an appointment with a heart specialist. So I went in for another ultrasound. They looked at the baby's heart in depth, ultrasound. And halfway through the ultrasound, she asked me to confirm the last four of my social and my last name, and I did. And then she said things just weren't adding up and she thought her machine was a little messed up. So we went into another ultrasound room and it wasn't the machine. She saw the same thing and she wouldn't tell me what was going on. I had no clue. She just said we would talk about it when the ultrasound was over. After the ultrasound finished, she said, I have the ultrasound from maternal fetal medicine and I could clearly see what the heart problems are in their ultrasound images. However, on my ultrasound machine, I can see the parts of the heart where the problems are, but the problems aren't there anymore. So Lindsay comes home with this news, no more heart problems, and talk about a miracle. I just walk over to the sticky note, I cross off the heart problems, and I said, I said, God's working on his to-do list. We had to go back to maternal fetal medicine for another ultrasound. And at this point, they had confirmed that his intestines were not coming out of his umbilical cord. And it just seemed like another miracle from God. And every time we came home, we got to cross something off the list. And every time we crossed something off the list, I felt like it made him stronger. And I felt like that was what God's miracle was in this. I was so relieved at that point. We finally got a little bit of good news. Even though the outcome of the situation didn't change and that we were still gonna lose him because of his brain, I believe that God made his heart stronger and cured those problems so that he can live, so we can hold him. We truly believe that God answered our prayer for a miracle. Maybe it wasn't exactly what we wanted, maybe he wasn't completely healed, but we believe that God made him strong enough so that when he was born, we could hold him for a little while and meet him while he was still alive. He's a miracle baby. He's somebody who has made an imprint on so many people's lives, including mine. He's, when I think of him, he reminds me of that person that you think God sends in your life to encourage your faith and to bring others to him. Because I truly do believe that God brings those people in your life to help you grow in your faith. And I believe that that's who Stephen was to God had given us our miracle, but one of the readings at Stephen's funeral was from the book of Job, and it says, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gives, and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. My mom was laying in bed, and she decided to Google stuff, and she texted me and said I had preeclampsia. Medical Center, this is Lacey. Uh, yes, so she definitely needs to come here. My body started to go a little crazy. I got very, very sick. I was sick for like five weeks. My body was so swollen that my toes didn't even touch the ground when I stood. We had to go to the triage place in the hospital. And after being evaluated, it turned out I did have preeclampsia. And the nurse said, we're gonna have to deliver this baby. That was the last thing that I wanted because I knew 
once this baby was delivered that we would lose him shortly after. And I just wanted to hold him in my womb for as long as possible because I felt like he was protected that way. I was pregnant for 31 weeks and I planned on keeping him for nine more weeks. But God had a different plan. The day before Thanksgiving was the day that we induced labor. And the next morning on Thanksgiving Day, the on-call doctor came in to talk to us. She told us that Stevens flipped the wrong way for delivery and that with that we had a couple of options. The first was to give Lindsay a C-section, but given Lindsay's blood pressure and the state that she was in in her preeclampsia, that could be dangerous and even risk her life. The other option was to try and deliver Stephen as he is, flip the wrong way, but that could risk having to take him out piece by piece. The last thing I wanted was for my baby to come into this world piece by piece. After hearing the choice that we had, mom and dad said we can't make this decision with you and they had to leave. And Lindsay was so exhausted, she said, I can't make this decision either. And she just fell asleep. And Lindsay slept for a couple of hours. And those couple of hours were the hardest of my entire life. I was left with this decision. Do I risk my wife's life for the chance to have a few minutes with my son? Or do I risk having to take my son out piece by piece? The entire couple of hours that Lindsay was asleep was just spent in prayer, asking God to please take this away from me. Please don't make me make this decision. And God came in with another miracle. And Lindsay woke up and she said, there's got to be another way. We got to text my doctor. Her doctor was at Thanksgiving with his family at the time. So she sent him a message and we were waiting for her. It felt like hours and hours and hours for him to respond. And finally he responded and he said, try and flip the baby. And that's what we did. We got together as a whole family and we prayed that the Holy Spirit would be in the room. We prayed for the intercession of John the Baptist who leapt in his mother's womb. We asked that Stephen would leap in his mother's womb so that he could come to us alive and we could meet him for a few minutes. So the on-call doctor wasn't really on board with this decision. I don't think that she thought it was gonna work, but she agreed to try it with us. So everyone else left the room. It was me, Lindsay, and the two on-call doctors. And I just started to pray. And they tried four times to flip Stephen, and four times it didn't work. And I, to this day, I can't tell you what happened, but in the room changed. Something happened and the room completely changed. And the time that they said was the last time that they're gonna try, the fifth try, Stephen flipped. And the atmosphere that changed in the room, I can only describe as the Holy Spirit. And that feeling after that moment didn't leave the entire time until Stephen was no longer with us. And then they broke my water and put a binder around me so that he would stay. I ended up getting very sick. They had to put an oxygen mask on me. I was very scared throughout this whole process because I didn't know what was happening to my body because it was reacting so differently than it ever has before. But I just knew that it was in God's hands. My doctor finally made it to the hospital. And when he did, shortly after, on November 22nd, 2018, at 7.23 p.m., I gave birth to a beautiful three pound, 1.7 ounce baby boy named Stephen Andrew Pope. I actually enjoy taking patients that are going to lose their little ones. Um, it's very fulfilling for me. It's a time um, that I feel 
like Christ is very close in those rooms. Most of the times I feel him in the rooms, just there's a special spirit in there. Um, and so when I, I heard I actually offered to take, a lot of the times we assign a, a nurses by like, okay, you've, it's been the longest since you've done it. Um, but I offered and she had to deliver preterm because she had preeclampsia. And it was kind of sad because I knew you guys wanted to take Stephen home and be with him as long as you could be at home. And just at 31 weeks, I wasn't sure that you would have time to take him home. And with her having to be on magnesium, I knew that would prolong the process of getting you home. Kind of somebody that might think is an unfortunate at the beginning was the fact that she had preeclampsia and had to be induced early so she didn't get sicker. Um, ended up being a huge blessing because um, Dr. Hodges had no idea and the way um, we've he's never seen it and I've never seen it where the cord just almost fell apart when we were holding it um, that him and I talked about it and we were and where you guys wanted to baptize him um, that had he had she continued the pregnancy and not been sick that we were afraid that cord would have just continued to fall apart and he would have been born dead already so it was to us um, I thought it was a you know, God's way of getting Stephen to you alive. There was just this sense of joy and gratefulness for everybody there for all the roles that they were playing in this journey. And it was just a beautiful thing to feel, just the love and the sense of peace in the room when Stephen was still alive. My husband got to help deliver him. And right after he was born, my father got to baptize him. After Stephen was born, I just remember holding him and telling him over and over again, I love you so much. He's gonna take care of you. I know I'm gonna think about you every day. You're perfect. You're so perfect. After Stephen was laying on my chest, the nurse would come every few minutes and check his heartbeat. And she would just tell me, yes, it's still beating. So every time I came in the room and was listening to the heartbeat, I um, each time I hoped that he was still there, just still with you guys. Um, but at the same time, I was like, well, I hope he passes peacefully and it's not a prolonged process and he doesn't struggle in his passing. Um, so each time it was it was a relief. I, I walked in the room and I was nervous and kind of shaky every time. Just, you know, is, is Steven still with us, still with you guys? And the last time when I didn't find the heartbeat, that was hard. And then she came and checked his heartbeat again. And after an hour and 28 minutes, he passed away. And she just shook her head. And she couldn't even say no. Because there were no words for that moment. After that, at 8.51 p.m. Thanksgiving Day, she declared my son dead. When Thomas started crying, and I still remember, <laughs> I cry every time I think about it. I still remember what Thomas said when he said, um, Lindsay's mom told him that, you know, he had gone to be with Jesus. And he said, he's my little brother. He was gonna be my little buddy. I was gonna take care of him. It's not Jesus's turn. And that's what he just kept saying is, it's not Jesus's turn, it's my turn. And I, 
at that point I had to step out of the room. You guys were trying to stay composed for Thomas and I was sobbing in the corner. <laughs> Having a, at the time, four-year-old, I just imagined my four-year-old saying that same thing. And that was a career moment that I will never forget. Listening to the not having a heartbeat was not something I looked forward to, but Thomas made it special. <laughs> we have a model in our Savior Christ. He, uh, he did the ultimate sacrifice for us and he died, which is a beautiful thing as if you go into any Catholic church anywhere in the world, you'll look up on the wall and you'll see a body hanging from a cross. And that in itself, most people might, there's a contradiction there because people, people say that's morbid. You see a dead body on a cross. What's, what is their beauty in that? And the beauty is, is that someone laid their life down for us and death in the same way, death, Jesus Christ died for us to open up the doors to heaven. So as Christians, we live the life that we're called to do. We're gonna see the beatific vision in Christ. And we have to die in order to do that. And there's a purpose for that. And death has a purpose and it's for us to go to the other side and see Christ in his, in, in his true form. But for us on earth, the people that have passed, we're sad because we have memories attached to them, which gives us sadness. But we can have the hope and we can boast in the glory that they're gonna receive when they get to the other side and we can be happy for them. After Stephen passed away, my body just crashed. I think God was just trying to keep me strong while he was alive. And then after he passed, I collapsed while trying to walk into the bathroom. And they had to rub my chest to get me back and they broke things for me to smell. There were nurses rushing in to come and help. My family was outside of the room and they said that all they saw was nurse after nurse just rush into the room. And it was another miracle that God was watching after me and that I was able to stay strong for that hour and 28 minutes that I had my baby boy in my arms. That next morning, I had to hand my son's body over to the funeral home. And that was the hardest thing, letting his body go. And I knew that his soul was in heaven but I just wanted to hold on to his body forever. Even though there are all these sad things that I will never forget, there's also so much joy and beauty in this that I will never forget. And that all comes from the grace of God. Throughout this process, we had a few people message me and ask, how could you still believe in God after this happened? How are you not angry at him? And all I could say to them is, how could you not believe in God? That's where the strength comes from, is from God. I'm, I'm so weak throughout this whole process, but my greatest weakness is God's greatest strength. Um. Many people's lives that I've talked to are are in awe of how this all went down. I people would ask me why are why am I not mourning? Why am I not crying? Why am I not in just an uproar? Well, well, I am mourning, and I mourn by my own way, and and I am in an uproar in my heart. But I truly know the real reason to why he was only with us that short while. And people, I tell them all the time that it's bittersweet. And, and they tell me, well, how can your grandson die, be bittersweet? And it's just exactly that. It's bitter because he did die. And because in my selfishness, I didn't get to spend the rest of my life with him. But the sweetness is in what he had accomplished, what God had accomplished through him you know, on the face of this earth with multiple people. My community lifted us up so much through this. 
they came over and some of the community came over and cleaned our house. We had people watching our children. There were so many people that brought us dinner. There were masses being dedicated from people throughout the community. And the prayers, there were so many prayers understanding and I think that's the one of the biggest things that you guys displayed in your humility in telling your story to people is that you didn't do this for yourself you don't see that anywhere you don't you didn't do it for your own glory you did it for Stephen's glory the fact that he is changing lives to this day and and he's not here but he is here and and that's what's beautiful about it because we as Christians when we believe in the resurrection we believe they're up there and God much more alive than they ever were down here. But why do good things happen to, or bad things happen to good people is, is in the book of John, John 9. And it, it, this, is, this is the verse that got me through it, was, uh, was Jesus and his disciples are walking through town and one of his disciples had asked, um, Jesus, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his sins or the sins of his parents? And Jesus said that it was neither. It was so that the works of God can be shown through this man. And that is why bad things happen to good people is so that the works of God can be shown to all of us, whether it's in, in death, in sickness, in, in, in anything. God does this in our lives, whether it be bittersweet, he does things like this in our lives to, to show that uh, that his will is going to be done. I really want him here, and 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 it kind of breaks my heart that he's not. Um, but every time I look at at what God had done through him, it it uh, it makes me realize that God can do anything with anybody at any time, including myself. And I'm a uh, a very sinful man. I'm very proud. And, and I lack in humility a lot of times. And, and every time I get in this rut of, of my self-loathing, myself, me, myself, and I, I can think about Stephen and what God had done through Stephen. And, uh, and it changes my, my outlook on, on that moment in my life. I'm sure I, I will miss him. I'm very proud that I had uh, got to baptize him before he passed that was very very important to me um and i'm very proud of his parents now stephen suffered even though we don't know what kind of suffering he went through he obviously suffered from the time he was conceived all the way through and you attached your suffering to stevens you and your wife because you saw what was going on and i think that the effect the effect that you guys made the choice to let Stephen be born has changed many lives already. It changed my life. It changed my, it changed my life through, through prayer, praying for you guys through this whole process. And really, it, it gave me comfort to fact that no, comfort in the fact to know that, that well, in Romans 5, I, I wrote this down because it's, it's just... It's just really apropos. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, who he has given us. We boast in the hope of glory of God. People can look at your story and they can have hope and they can and understand that there's a reason for everything. There's a sense of purpose. There are no chance happenings in this world and that Stephen's a perfect example of that, that there's a reason. God, God, uh, God cultivated all of this stuff, that, that everything happened and, and that it's a good story. It's a good story. It's a pretty story. And we can't focus on the sadness because there's a reason for sadness. And that's, if you look through the scriptures, it's like I said, rejoice in your sufferings. That sounds, that's a contradiction, isn't it? So sometimes life is a contradiction, but through Christ, we understand that. I mean, God tests us. God, God tests us constantly. When you read the scriptures, God tests everybody. God tests Abraham, 
tested Moses, tested all the prophets, and he tests us today. So what you guys went through was a test, and, and look, what it te- look what it provided. It provided a stronger faith for not just you guys, but for a lot of people, that, that there's still faith in this world, and, and we have hope, and we can boast in the hope of glory, and that's what I think is still happening today through Stephen's death. You can put your whole story from the very beginning all the way to the end. You could put that in the Bible somewhere and somebody would read that in a thousand years ago. That's a story about Jesus. I mean, because that's what it is. And that's, that's how I look at it. And that's how it's affected me in a positive way that, that there are gospel stories every day in this world and we need to attach our tells to them. And there's beauty in them. And there's beauty in your story. There were people from eight different countries praying for this little baby. There were Catholics and non-Catholics praying. There were even people that prayed that really haven't even prayed before. And this baby, in the hour and 28 minutes that he was alive, changed so many people. And he continues to change people. If we blame God in a time like this, it just allows the door to open up for the devil to come in. And that was the last thing that we wanted in this situation because the devil is not invited. This was all God's glory and it still is. And that's why we needed him. And that's why we leaned on him. And I believe that that was Stephen's purpose was so the works of God could be shown. And they are still shown to this day. There is no foot too small that it can't impact this world. I love you, Stephen. And you are forever loved and forever remembered.